chair, vice chair, committee members, and participants. We are now live. Thank you. The Committee on Commerce and Economic Development for Wednesday, December 6th. I want to apologize for starting a little late as the Education Committee ran over. Um, before we begin the public hearing, I would like to make the following announcements. Due to the continuing threat to public health from COVID-19, City Council Committees are currently meeting remotely. We're using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings is Council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. I now note that the hour has come. Mr. McGonagall, can you please call the roll and take attendance? Good afternoon. Uh, Councilwoman Brooks? Good afternoon. I am present. Councilwoman Gautier. Present. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Councilwoman uh, Gilmore Richardson. Councilman Johnson. Councilman Jones. Good afternoon, everyone. I am present. And Councilman Squilla. Good afternoon, present. Thank you, a quorum of the committee is present and the hearing is now called to order. This is a public hearing on the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development regarding bill number 230746. Mr. McMonagle, can you please read the title of the bill? Bill number 230746, amending chapter 9-2300 of the Philadelphia Code to provide greater protections for displaced contract workers. Thank you. Before we begin to hear testimony from our witnesses we have for today, everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consent to being recorded. Additionally, try to recognize the members for the questions or comments they have for witnesses. I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Ms. McMonagall, can you please call the panel? We have to testify this afternoon on bill number 230746. So we've received a uh, written testimony from the administration, but nobody from the administration to testify. Um, Councilman Harrity, would you like to be recognized before we call the first panel? I would. I would. Thank you, uh, Chairman, Vice Chair, and colleagues, and all the guests here. Uh, I just have 10 short points uh, about the bill that I'd like to put out there. Starting with number one, uh, supporting Philly workers. This is a plan to give extra help to workers facing changes in Philadelphia. Number two, plain language and definition. If you hire people for big buildings or services in the city of Philadelphia, like janitorial, security, or food service, you're part of this plan. Smooth transition, number three. When a new company takes over, we're ensuring current workers keep their jobs for at least 90 days. It's all about a smooth transition for everyone. Number four, priority job offers. If a place closes, the workers if the place reopens, fair chances for everyone. Number five, strict rules, fair play. There's a group making sure everyone plays fair, if not, consequences like paying back wages or giving the job back are options. Uh, agency oversight, number six, an agency is like a referee making sure everyone follows the plan. They'll set rules and help people understand what's happening. Clear communication, number seven, workers won't be in the dark. They'll know exactly what's happening, who's taking over and what their new job will look like. Number eight, protection of Philadelphia workers. The bottom line is this plan is about looking out for the workers in Philadelphia, making sure they're treated right during changes. 
sure everyone follows the plan. They'll set rules and help people understand what's happening. Clear communication, right, number you. seven. Workers won't be in the dark. They'll know exactly what's happening, who's taking over, and what their new job will look like. Number eight, protection of Philadelphia workers. The bottom line is this plan is about looking out for the workers in Philadelphia, making Number nine, fair wages and benefits, ensuring workers get fair pay and benefits so they're not just keeping their jobs, but also being compensated properly. Number 10, easy compliant process, complaint, I'm sorry, number 10, easy complaint process, creating a simple process for workers to rise concerns or complaints if someone doesn't seem right, giving them a voice in the process. Did you hear me? Can yes, you hear me? Number. Yes. Yep. All right. And just in closing, I'd like to say I know this is a hard vote, uh, but a wise woman told me that the people have sent us here to make hard decisions. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Council Member, uh, for that. And Mr. McMonagle, would you like to please uh, read the list for the first panel? Yes, can we please have um, and then this in this order and then if you would not mind um, being prepared to testify after the person in front of you speaks. Uh, Tiffany Cherry. Daisy Cruz. Lyle Rowan. And then Keisha Hayes in that order, please. OK, we'll start with uh, Tiffany and then we'll proceed after Tiffany's done. Would please refrain from asking questions until all have testified. Tiffany, just state your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Tiffany, are you able to unmute? Sean, are we having any technical difficulties? Not that I'm aware of, Mr. Chairman. Tiffany, can you hear us? Hi. I think, yep, there Good you go. My name is Tiffany Cherry. Um, I'm here today. Um, I am a Bellevue worker for 13 years. When I started- Are you able to unmute? Uh, can you hear me? Should be unmuted. We, we can hear can you, you hear yes. Me? Sure, we have any tech yes, we hear, we, hear, we hear you fine. Keep testifying, Tiffany. I'm aware of Mr. Chairman. Tiffany, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you guys. Can y'all hear me? Um, I'm here today. Yes, we can hear you. I'm yes. When I started, it's a delay. It's a delay. We, we can hear you, yes. Yes, yes, try not to listen to the if you're watching the if you're watching it on the okay. screen, try not yes. to watch on the screen because it is delayed if you want to um, or turn the volume down. Thank you. Just testify. Yeah, just OK. Yeah, My name is Tiffany Cherry. I am a Bell. Bell I have been a Bellevue worker for 13 years. When I started, we was we were making $15 an hour and now making $22 an hour. The Bellevue started transitioning to new management as COVID hit. Fully trans is fully uh, transitioned um, early 2022. Uh, half of the building is still the Bellevue Hotel, while the side I work on used to have 10 floors of commercial um, commercial floors. Um, out of the 10 floors that we have, we have only down four floors. Six of the floors is under construction. Um, it's going under construction for residential. Um, for residential. Before the cuts and the renovations happened, we had 23 workers, 23 cleaning workers, and now we are down to five total. One in daytime, four at night. Wow. Uh, 
renovation. While six is under renovation um, uh, for residential, before the cuts happened, did I say that? I said all that already. I'm sorry. Pages. All right. That means that 18 um, workers who are no longer at the building. The threat of losing our jobs isn't just a threat of our wages. It could lead to us losing health insurance, pension, and other benefits. The second management company that came in immediately cut the workforce. We have heard that another company um, took over, which we do have another cleaning company that took over November the 1st. Um, the new company that came in, um, I'm not sure what's going to go on. It's it's early stages right now with the new company coming in. But however, we had a new property manager that came in that wanted to get rid of us. Um, but because of the union, she wasn't able to do that. Uh, with all of these renovations and new things that's going on in the, uh, as far as the construction and the residential um, who knows what the four floors going to look like in a few years? We could lose those four floors of commercial to residential. If we use those four, if we lose those four floors um, to residential, I would like to be able to come back and work in the Bellevue. I've been in the Bellevue for a long time. I created a, a lot of relationships with um, tenants and, you know, just we, we became a family there. So with the renovations going on and the building shutting down, we would like to be the first ones that be able to come back to work at the Bellevue if that happens. Um, so we absolutely need our local elect, uh, elected officials to help protect our jobs so that we can fight and maintain our rights, wages, and working conditions that we deserve. In this new pandemic climate, we need to make sure that owners do, do us. Hold on. We need to make sure owners don't use the excuse of renovations and co conversions um, of their buildings to undercut the labor standards that we achieve to help us provide decent living decent lives for our families. The world is trying its best to recover from the first global pandemic of our lifetime. It's enough that many of us lost our family and friends. We should do everything we can to avoid additional stress and tremultuous of us losing our livelihoods as well, tremultuous. So I have a picture right here of city council out supporting us um, during the time we was fighting for our contract. I'm not sure if y'all see this picture, it's kind of small. So you stood for us in front of a building on 16th and Cherry, which is currently in the middle of a transfer of ownership and possible renovation from commercial from commercial to residential. We absolutely appreciate your support then. Please continue to stand with us now to protect what we have earned. I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Tiffany. Can we have Daisy, please? Daisy Cruz. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Yes, just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Sure. Uh, Daisy Cruz. OK, ready to go. Uh, just like I just said, good afternoon. I just thank you all for giving us the opportunity to be able to um, give our testimony today. Um, I'm the district leader for SCIU Local 32 BJ. Um, I represent over 10,000 workers in Philadelphia and the tri-state area. We represent um, and thousands of those are actually work in Center City, just like Tiffany was um, referencing earlier. As you all heard, a lot of our members find themselves in danger of losing their jobs due to no fault of their own. Our union members are cleaners, security officers, building engineers who make sure that the buildings are clean, well-maintained, 
and secure so that businesses are able to function properly. In all the years that I've been doing this job, I've come to understand that our workers can easily be taken for granted and are the unseen workers that people don't see every single day. COVID represented, COVID presented the most constant pressing problem we have ever seen. During the pandemic, just like Tiffany talked about, our members became highly recognized in a way that they had never been before. While the rest of the world was quarantined, mass and dealing with things that, that, you know, dealing with death, not knowing what was coming next, um, a lot of people were able to work from home, but not our members. Um, unfortunately, they, you know, fortunate and unfortunately, they were celebrated and honored as essential workers when it was still unclear exactly how the virus was spreading and what they were actually bringing, to, bringing home to their families every single day. They did all the extra deep cleaning in these buildings, constantly kept the buildings running and help enforce social distance and mask mandates in efforts to keep us all safe and healthy as possible. Mm -hmm. Many of them were laid off. They lost hours and some unfortunately lost their lives. Now that we're coming out of the worst of it and entering a time of recovery, we find that the businesses that our members work so hard to help stay afloat are making adjustments themselves. We expect that as social and economic times change, businesses will adapt, but we cannot sacrifice the jobs that our low wage, hardworking Philadelphia people um, have been doing this work for so long so that billionaires can continue to get richer. We fought for displaced worker laws in the past to close the loopholes that left workers vulnerable to job loss from irresponsible businesses trying to avoid, to, trying to avoid uh, living wages, benefits that our members fought so hard in their contracts for all these years. This new language is not a new concept. It's simply adapting an already existing law to address the changing circumstances. Passing these amendments to the existing laws will give workers a chance to hold on to their wages, their health benefits, their pensions at a time when they are the ones who need it the most. Businesses should not benefit at the expense of poor, hardworking people who live paycheck to paycheck. Just like Tiffany referenced earlier as well, council members, state reps, senators, and as well as Mayor Lex Sherelle Parker marched with us and stood with us on August 29th of this year at 16th and Cherry for a rally to protect our workers and protect their jobs. Workers in that exact building, just like Tiffany talked about, that are risking, that are at risk of losing their jobs if this bill does not pass this year. We cannot put big businesses above low wage workers. We ask that you continue to support us by voting yes on this displaced worker bill. By doing so, you will be sending a clear message that we are all in this recovery process together. If you vote no, you will be voting no on poor work, poor hardworking people and voting yes for billionaires to continue to get richer. I thank you for the time and letting me testify. Thank you, Daisy. Uh, can we now hear from Lyle Rowan, please? Yes, thank you. Um, hey, Lyle, just state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Lyle Rowan. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Lyle Rowan, and I'm joining you uh, as an Associate General Counsel for Local 32 BJ. Uh, thank you for your time and attention here on this important matter. Um, I've been working with 32 BJ for nearly 20 years, um, providing legal support for the union's organizing and representational work. Um, the union represents membership throughout 11 states and the District of Columbia. Um, I have been focused particularly in the city of Philadelphia and the state of Pennsylvania generally in the past several years, including our work at the Philadelphia airport and um, on uh, various representational matters in the city. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to talk a little bit about the, the substance of the law and how displaced worker laws like this, which e exist throughout the union's jurisdiction, um, provide a vital source of stability. Uh, uh, to a workforce that is subject to uh, an enormous amount of disruption based on changes in who their employer is. Um, it's a, a unique aspect of the building service industry uh, that I think warrants our attention and that this, this law as it exists provides uh, helpful protection, but uh, uh, amendments are needed as proposed to strengthen those protections. Um, 
so I want to just outline generally the industry um, relies upon sort of two essential employment structures uh, for the uh, for employees in this industry. Uh, first, a building service staff may typically be employed directly by a building owner, whether that's a real estate company or a co-op, uh, like co-op or condominium board. Um, alternatively, building service employees may be employed by a commercial contractor uh, that is hired by a building owner to, to provide services for a period of time through a service contract. Um, so these are the two basic structures. And within that, there's different, there's essentially four uh, four common scenarios in which uh, building employer, the, I'm sorry, the, the, the employee's employer will change, which creates instability um, in their employment. Uh, the first of these is when the cleaning contract or the, the building service contractor simply changes. So the building owner has an existing contractor and they decide to go with a different company. So they just switch it out. A new contractor comes in and the employees have to apply for their jobs again. They don't know what they're in for in terms of the new terms of employment. Uh, so that's one. Another is when the building owner used to hire the employees directly, but decides to contract out those jobs and the new contractor comes in. Those two scenarios are currently addressed under the existing law. But what the, ex the existing law does not address is two other scenarios, which we see uh, with some frequency. Um, one is when there is a cleaning contract or uh, building service contractor in place that employs the workers, but the building owner decides to terminate that agreement and hire the employees in-house. In that situation, the employees then have to reapply for their jobs directly with the building owner. Again, the terms and conditions of that employment can change based on the demands of the, of the owner, who is now the employer. Uh, another would be where the employees are directly employed by the building owner and the building is sold. Um, and a new owner comes in and also decides to employ the, employ the workers directly. That incoming owner is now a new employer and the employees have to apply for their jobs again. Um, and that's another scenario that the existing law does not apply to and provides no protection. So without the protection of a displaced worker law, these employees who have many times served in the building for years or even decades um, could be thrown out on the street there's no other requirement that requires them to be uh, employed by the new employer that comes in. Um, so for these different scenarios that are currently not addressed in the existing law, we feel the proposed amendments are, are crucial. Um, in, in addition, it, it really needs to be recognized as, as Daisy mentioned, uh, that the COVID pandemic inflicted an enormous and lasting impact on the commercial side of the building service industry the 32 bj feel feels needs to be addressed specifically following the advent of remote work in certain pockets of the market and in our industry we've seen shifts of investment in, de in development from commercial office space to residential properties in some instances as described this transition transition results in the temporary partial or complete closure of a building while the property is renovated from one purpose to another, resulting in painful displacement and disruption to the lives and economic security of the employees who work there. So while the existing displaced worker law in Philadelphia does provide important protection for many of the city's building service employees, more attention is needed both to close the existing loopholes and to further address the new challenges of a changing real estate landscape. This bill, we believe, will address these needs. And there are several important changes to the amendments, but I want to mention three in particular. Uh, first, as I described earlier, the existing law uh, only applies when jobs are assumed by a new incoming contractor and not when the building ownership hires the employees directly. Uh, the, the proposed amendments extend this important protection to employees. Um, the second, with the changes in the industry shifting towards residential development, the bill adds job classifications common to residential property management that, were not, that are not included in the existing law, specifically concierge services and door attendant services. Uh, without these changes, central services within the residential market would not be covered by the law's protection. And finally, the proposed amendments include a new recall protection provision to address what we expect to be a more common problem. 
which is the layoff of existing building staff in a commercial building due to partial or full temporary closure of the building for renovations necessary to repurpose the property, a shift we expect to see from commercial use to residential use. In these cases, the amendments would provide a minimum measure of continued job protection to, to grant those displaced employees the right to be recalled to their former building when it reopens in its new form. There will still be hardship endured during this hiatus period and many employees may simply move on to other employment elsewhere, but this provides them a choice to return and resume their service in the future if they so desire. Uh, with these comments, I respectfully urge you to consider the importance of these amendments to the working people of Philadelphia and pass them into law. Uh, I do want to mention before I close, uh, I, I did have a chance to review a, uh, a recent memorandum drafted by the, the law department, which provides some very helpful uh, insight uh, into potential problems, legal problems with uh, the proposed amendments. The first of those has to do with the separation of powers under the city charter. And uh, the union certainly has no quarrel with the law department's view that the existing amendments essentially contain a, a lot of prescriptive language, a lot of directives uh, that would be coming from council to an executive agency. So the union certainly acknowledges that whatever executive agency would be responsible for enforcement, that, that they would retain their lawful discretion and autonomy in terms of the policies that they would uh, implement for uh, to ensure compliance. Um, and we th felt that it was helpful to have an administrative enforcement mechanism in the ordinance just to ensure efficient um, enforcement. But the uh, the lawful executive discretion that would be used to carry that out, of course, remains solely within the executive agency. Um, and the second uh, had to do with um, special legislation and, and that it, that caution did prompt a review of the of the language and the union did recommend a, a sort of 11th hour revision to try to correct that problem and that had to do with the, the new provision regarding recall rights for employees that are laid off and the definition of an eligible laid off employee uh, was improperly narrow to only uh, include those who um, had worked during six months of the calendar year 2023. And that, that was not the intention. The intention was to create an eligibility formula of working six of the 12 months prior to a layoff, um, regardless of what year that occurred. Uh, but it would only be um, in effect for building closures that occur after January uh, 1st of 2024, um, fo following the bill's hopeful passage. Um, so that was just a, a, an oversight in drafting in terms of the uh, definition of an eligible employee under that provision. And, and we've uh, pr proposed a correction, a very, very short correction that will resolve that problem. So thank you for your time and attention. I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Mr. McGonagall, do you have a list of next people to testify? Yes, can we please have Keisha Hayes? Keisha, you can act to just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Keisha's in with Tiffany, they're just waiting to unmute. Oh, OK, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, good evening. My name is Keisha Hayes. I've been a cleaner in the public ledger building at 620 Chestnut for 29 years. I would like to speak to you for a moment on the importance of the displaced workers protections currently on the books in Philadelphia and why we why we have such an urgent need to amend the current language. Our jobs, has, our jobs has become the kind of jobs that had changed lives and improved families. 
and improved families. Over decades of negotiations and improvements, we have been able to earn the kind of wages and benefits that help us support our families and neighborhoods and communities. But on those gains could be lost if another company takes over and does not hire us and negotiates to keep our union contract. Last year, my building switched cleaning companies overnight to a non-union company. And when I came into work the next day, my coworkers and I were informed that our services were no longer needed. Or after over 20 years, I wasn't even allowed in the building. After calling around and asking for an application to the new company, I was told I wasn't even allowed to apply. I immediately contact my union because of the place workers protections, and we have fought for, for we have fought able to keep our jobs and another and another cleaning company eventually came in fully respecting our rights and agreeing to our contract. OK, and now coming out of the pandemic, we are faced with a new threat after working through the COVID and being frontline, making buildings safe for business. We faced it. We are facing. We are facing. We went from 22 cleaners down to two. We went down to two cleaners and as I speaking right now, they are doing condos all around us. They completed one side and we're still working in there while they're completing condo condos. Um, tenants has moved out. We maybe got about three tenants left. So maybe by this, by the end of the year, we may don't even have a job. I mean, so I don't know how I'm going to be able to feed myself, you know, take care of myself. Like my life just changed dramatically just like that. I don't think that's fair and I know that I need my job. So I'm I'm praying that you guys can take this in consideration and pass this. Because we need it. Thank you. Thank you. I have a blessing. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Good okay. job, Mr. McMahon. Can we please um, have William Carter? On our second panel, um, introduce himself and, and prepare his testimony. Will, just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. Can you hear me? Oh, good morning. We hear you. <laughs> good yeah, evening. We hear you fine. <laughs> good evening now. I should have said, I should have said good afternoon, but good evening. Um, I want to thank Councilman. Uh, Squilla and members of the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development um, for this opportunity to testify regarding this legislation. Um, I'm actually testifying on behalf of the Inclusive Growth Coalition, which is inclusive of the Greater Philadelphia Chamber, the African American Chamber, the Hispanic Chamber, the Asian Chamber, and the Independent Business Alliance, which is the LGBTQ Chamber here in the city. And um, our organization is advocating for job and business growth in Philadelphia through the engagement of diverse parties from every corner of the city to raise the standard of living for all Philadelphians. We know shared prosperity can only be achieved when all Philadelphians are provided access to opportunities. Um, and the IGC is committed to informing local leaders regarding policies that will grow all businesses, increase the number of people working in good paying jobs in the city of Philadelphia. And uh, particularly during this recovery period, it's imperative that we support business growth and the jobs that come with it. And uh, doing so, as we know, also benefits our city through an expanded tax base to improve city services, reduce poverty, and make our city safer. Uh, regarding the matter at hand, and you know, I've been listening to the testimony and certainly understand the concerns. Um, we, we must impress upon you, however, that there's a various substantive issues with this legislation, but beyond that, the lack of engagement with stakeholders on a bill that significantly affects the diverse business community has uh, quite frankly been unconscionable. Um, at the time of its introduction, uh, we expressed concerns to the sponsor regarding the form and substance of the bill. At that time, we were assured that uh, it wouldn't be li listed for hearing until we had further conversation and, and meaningful interaction with the sponsor uh, on this bill. However, you know, we are now dealing with a bill that was placed on the hearing calendar last minute without notice to stakeholders from the sponsor. Further, the only Zoom we've had on this bill was within the last two days, 
during which no substantive matters were discussed. And I'm, I'm certain, um, having known the sponsor for a while, that his heart is in the right place and that his intentions are great. But we, uh, we know that uh, city council and administration, particularly city council at large, represents all sides, rep should be representing all entities and all, um, all uh, interested parties, particularly on bills like this. So we fully understand that one of the principal re responsibilities of unions like SEIU are is to encourage companies to hire their members. We're all a part of member service organizations and work hard every day to provide benefits and increase our respective memberships. One, our main expectation, I should say, however, is that when public policy matters affect our members, they are likewise considered and properly engaged. The process surrounding this bill has not allowed for such engagement and has denied our membership full opportunity to have their concerns expressed and properly considered. Legislation, especially of this magnitude and impact, must be thoroughly considered in light of our city's current economic state. Entrepreneurs of all demographics work 24-7 to provide goods and services that benefit the community at large. And when those uh, that succeed grow, they create needed jobs that inure to the benefit of the city and its residents. Um, these business owners and these entrepreneurs, these hardworking individuals significantly rely on helpful relationships and proper support from their government leaders in doing so. However, when this valuable segment of society is not properly engaged by government in policy matters that affect their sustainability and growth, there is an immediate erosion of confidence that local leaders represent them equally. Legislation of this importance and impact must be considered adequately, especially in light of the current state of businesses citywide. We are certainly not here to disparage service unions or their cause. However, we are certain there needs to be a fair process that does not, that does not unevenly tilt favor towards labor over service companies in matters like this. And given the substantive and issue, uh, process issues attended here too, we ask that you not consider this legislation at this time and allow Philadelphia's hardworking diverse service contractors a proper seat at the table for the issues to be considered. I thank you for your time and um, I'm open for any questions. Are there any questions from any member of the committee or any of the ones who have testified up to this time? Seeing none. Mr. McMonicles, can you please read the next person to testify? Yes, can we please have Regina Hairston? Good afternoon. Good evening, Councilman Squilla and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify. Uh, again, my name is Regina A. Hairston, and I'm the president and CEO of the African American Chamber of Commerce. Today, I testify on behalf of the Diverse Chambers Coalition of Philadelphia, which was formed by the AACC, along with the Asian American Chamber of Commerce of Greater Philadelphia, Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and the LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce, which is the Independence Business Alliance to work collectively as a community to meet the unique challenges diverse businesses and enterprises face when they engage with our local economy. Today, we come together to advocate for the diverse small business owners in the city of Philadelphia, urging members of council to engage with our coalition in the development and implementation of policies and regulations that may impact them. The businesses we represent are the backbone of our neighborhoods, providing essential goods and services and employment opportunities to their fellow Philadelphians. On behalf of the coalition, I am testifying today in opposition of Bill 23046, which we believe irresponsibly circumvents vital democratic processes overreaches well beyond legal feasibility and is crafted with total disregard for inclusivity or equity by leaving out the diverse voices of business owners who would be more, most impacted by its implementation. Substantively, this bill creates undue and likely illegal burdens for businesses uh, business owners of all kinds by telling them who and how they can hire as a part of a workforce. One goal for our city on the precipice of new leadership should be to create a business environment wherein all entities, especially the diverse businesses that we represent, 
can flourish and create meaningful jobs and supportive and through public policy, support it through pub, uh, rather than public policy, one where no one wants to operate. We should not aim to create extra barriers and drive enterprise away when our city is already at an economic crisis point. And as we have testified before, quality jobs do not appear without enterprise. Beyond the substantive matters of the bill, the process by which this bill comes before us, to put it kindly, is unsettling. It has been hastily cobbled together without concern for the diverse business owners of the city, appears irresponsible in its overreach, and represents a dangerous precedent for democratic norms in this legislative body. We are a city that is defined by the democratic process, and we are appalled that the parties most impacted by this legislation have not been included in the crafting of it. Coming as it did, we cannot say with certainty what the direct impact of this bill will be on the many businesses we represent. Neither can anyone else, including city council, as there have not been studies or evidence attached to this that empirically state what any impacts to Philadelphia businesses might be. Have there been any considerations or studies on how many Philadelphia buildings would fall under the law's new and sudden auspices? Have there been an audit about the multiple types of businesses that are conducting their services in buildings within complexes of at least 50,000 square feet or residential complex of buildings of at least 50 uh, dwelling units? Has anyone paused to consider how many diverse owned businesses like grocery stores, wholesale operations, or even nonprofits would be affected by new regulations without warning? The change in the policy proposed is of significant magnitude and requires the engagement of affected parties. From our perspective, businesses who operate in the kinds of build buildings cited in the bill have not had a meaningful opportunity to participate in a discussion about the challenges that the legislation would create, create after all they were consult or they were not consulted or even invited to participate in any robust form of debate. We believe that our elected officials have an affirmative responsibility to reach out and, get, and engage a diverse population of community members in a cadre of business owners to determine how they would be impacted by legislation. We already know that well over a majority of our business owners cite a lack of ease of doing business with the city as a major hurdle to their success and sustainability as in indicated in our recent 22-23 budget cycle diverse chamber small business survey. It is not surprising that they feel this way when burdensome regulations are hoisted upon them without their input and without regard for their lived experience. Small businesses in Philadelphia remain a very critical at a very critical juncture and their recovery as well from the impacts of the pan pandemic and there are and there are causes for concern for our leaders and elected officials. The majority of respondents to our survey indicated that they would not recommend Philadelphia as a place in which to do business, which many respondents cited a lack of ease of doing business. The high cost of doing business and crime and safety concerns as primary detractors. This bill represents yet another burden placed in front of them. As business leaders, as community leaders, and as residents of this city, it is imperative that we spend our time planning for a safe, equitable, and robust economic environment where businesses can thrive and jobs can be created. The leaders, staff, and members of the Diverse Chamber of Coalition of Philadelphia, we are ready to work with you to build stronger and safer Philadelphia and to have a balanced approach to public policy as it impacts our members and, it, and as it impacts all Philadelphians as a whole. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Ms. Harrison. And uh, I do hear your concerns. And uh, anytime we as uh, legislators come up with uh, legislation, we do like to have input from all, all voices. Uh, and um, if you feel that uh, that uh, is, wasn't happening, uh, you know, we will work in the future uh, to do that. Um, is there any other questions from any members of council? Seeing no questions, um, Mr. Wonderful, can you please read the next person to testify? Yes, can we please have uh, Jennifer Rodriguez, please? Jennifer, just state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Please. 
I don't see a Jennifer Rodriguez on the list. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't see anyone, Councilman. Um, can we have a Mr. Andre Del Valle? Mr. Del Valle, if you're available, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Absolutely. Uh, good evening, Chairman Scuola and members of the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. My name is Andre Del Valle. I'm the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Pennsylvania Apartment Association, representing over 285,000 units and 300 property management companies across the Commonwealth. Locally here in Philadelphia, we represent over 38,000 units and 49 property management companies. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify on bill number 230746, which we oppose for a number of reasons from procedural concerns to the vague language that leaves this bill ambiguous, potentially opening up members to non-compliance due to how the bill can be interpreted. There's also a tremendous lack of data on the potential impact of this legislation. Over the last two years, I've served, as, I've served as vice president of the Pennsylvania Apartment Association. I've had the pleasure of working with several of you on bills that impacted the multifamily housing industry to find common ground on legislation to assist the residents of Philadelphia. We've been part of stakeholder meetings. We've been able to share our concerns and negotiate through those challenges and work with you through a legislative process prior to a final vote. Unfortunately, the same cannot be say, said about this bill, which is being fast tracked on our final weeks of session as you will hear today from members of the business community. A bill of this magnitude that impacts so many different stakeholders should have gone through a proper process, not be rushed at the 11th hour. For months, we were not engaged. For weeks, we were told the bill would not run. For weeks, emails went unanswered regarding the bill. And only two days ago were we given a forum where, with the bill sponsor to share our concerns about the bill. We were told we would receive amendments. And even to this day, we still have not received any amendments prior to submitting our testimony for today's hearing. We don't know this bill's full impact. We don't know the number of buildings and have several concerns on the reach, scope, and even the legality of this bill. This bill, while we know is well-spirited, raises several concerns from the definition of a worker and contractor being used interchangeably to handcuffing employers who may decide to switch contractors to hire within and creating a nightmare process for civil enforcement and interfering with an already existing existing process through the collective bargaining process. Simply put, this legislation raises more questions than concrete answers that leaves a number of us still confused on the potential impact and has a number of different interpretations. What we do know is that this legislation before you specifically targets our industry by expanding coverage to concierge and door attendant services, but limiting it to the workers of buildings of at least 50,000 square feet and residential buildings with at least 50 units a threshold that specifically targets those buildings that would be prime to convert from office space to residential. While the bill may seem straightforward, this bill has unintended consequences as it's impacting ongoing federal initiatives that promote affordable housing through the conversion of office space to affordable units. As we know, our nation is facing an affordable housing crisis. And while we're working on a number of initiatives federally and even at the state level to reduce the red tape to constructing more multifamily housing, this legislation before you today adds more red tape and disincentivizes owners and simply the business community from wanting to come and convert or even stay in Philadelphia. PAA prides itself on cross collaborating, cross collaborating with our elected officials at all levels of government, including White House officials to find innovative solutions to our nation's housing challenges. On October 27, 2023, President Biden announced new actions to support the conversion of high vacancy commercial buildings to residential use, including the new financing, um, the new financing, technical assistance and sale of federal properties. This announcement will create much needed housing that is affordable, energy efficient, near transit and good jobs. This initiative piqued the interest of a number of our members, our larger members who have left Philadelphia to return to the city and once again build, create units and create affordable units that we desperately need. We continue to say that there's an affordable housing crisis, yet those very same housing providers and are, dis are disincentivized uh, by creating more units through the added regulations like the one before you today. This bill does not only impact those office conversions either, this impacts a number of other sectors and existing buildings, which you will hear from today. We're just committed to work with stakeholders that you hear, with, that you hear from and have this bill go through a proper process. There is no difference if this bill passes today or if it's the first bill that's introduced next session that helps address concerns from the stakeholders that you've heard from. This bill sets a dangerous precedent for the city of Philadelphia, dictating to the private sector who they can and cannot hire and how they can operate business within the city of Philadelphia. 
We look forward to working with this committee, the rest of council, the next administration on a number of policies, and hope that in the future, stakeholders will be engaged in the legislative process to ensure that all concerns are addressed prior to the passage of any ordinance of this magnitude. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Devalley, for your uh, testimony. And uh, like we said earlier, uh, we will ensure that uh, in all new legislation moving forward, that um, all parties felt like they will be involved in that process and apologize if that wasn't the case in this instance. Uh, Mr. McMonagle, please read uh, the next person to testify. Mr. Chairman, we have no other people uh, scheduled to testify. Is there any questions from the committee? All right. Um, hearing no further questions from members of the last panel and there being no other panels to testify, we'll take a brief break to connect members for the public. Are there any public comments for this legislation? There is no there public no comment. comment. Okay, hearing no public comment. Um, And no further testimony and no no further questions. From members uh, from the committee and no other comments for the witnesses to testify. I'll ask if there's anyone else present in this hearing whose name we have failed to call that wishes to offer testimony for the bill being considered today. Hearing none, I want to thank all the panels witnesses for the participation today as we value your uh, Opinions. I now invite all panelists and witnesses to please disconnect from the meeting before we go into our public meeting. We will now pause the proceedings briefly as multiple participants leave for the hearing. Thank you. That will include the, that will conclude our public hearing for the committee, and we will now go into a public meeting. Consider the actions to be taken on the bills before the committee today. We are now convening our public meeting. Mr. McGonagall, can you please call the roll and take attendance for the members who are present? Councilwoman Brooks. Councilwoman Gautier. Present. Councilwoman Gilmore Richardson. Present. Councilman, Councilman Johnson. Present. Councilman Jones. Present. Councilman Squilla. Present. Thank you. We will now go into our public meeting. The chair would like to recognize Councilmember Jones for a motion on the amendment to bill number 230746. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I offer an amendment to bill number 230746, a copy of that amendment has been circulated to all members of council and I move for its adoption of the amendment to bill number 230746. Second. The chair notes for the record, council member Godier seconds the motion. It is moved and properly second that the amendment to bill number 230746 be approved. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries and the amendment to bill number 230746 has been approved. The chair now recognizes Councilman Jones for a motion on bill number 230746 as amended. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. I move that bill number 230746 as amended be moved from this committee with a favorable recommendation. And furthermore, uh, ask that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading at our next session of council. Second. 
Chair notes for the record, Council Member Gaudier seconds the motion. It has been moved and properly seconded that the bill number 230746, as amended, be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to submit the first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The ayes have it and the motion carries. That will conclude our meeting for today. Thank you all for attendance and the business before the Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. Everybody have a great day and thank you for waiting and being patient during this process. Have a Council great Member Squilla, can I be Mark President and is voted aye? Council Member Brooks is recorded as present and voted aye on the passage of the amendment and the bill number 230746. Thank you. That'll include our meeting for today. Everybody Thank have a great you. day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank Congratulations, you, Mr. Chair. CM Harity. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.